sudden we were celebrating deficits that were going down, and that was a short-lived affair. Uh, now, maybe not. Um, Scott, good to have you back. Great to be back. Thanks, Neil. What do you make of the fact, I mean, we were celebrating these deficits that were only $4 billion, as if that's much to trumpet, and now they're going the other way. Uh, as a business guy, as a guy who had to meet a bottom line at Sun Microsystems and, and a host of other opportunities since, uh, it's just reminding folks that you got to control your money, right? Well, yeah, I think that's part of the problem, but somehow we've got to start putting policies in place that actually deal with, I think, the most important number out there, and it isn't what the market is doing in the short run or what the GDP is doing or whatever, but it's the labor participation rate. And we've got a serious issue. I'm all about jobs. I'm all about people working, uh, staying out of trouble, paying taxes, uh, having uh, money to, uh, and not other people's money, but money that you earn that you're uh, spending to drive the economy. And the labor participation rate is, uh, I mean, the unemployment rate is like the most fictitious number in the history. I mean, if a, if a public company ever issued a number like that, they'd all get thrown in jail for, for uh, breaking some SEC law. But the <laughs> government keeps talking about this low unemployment rate, but the labor participation rate is stunningly, I mean, it's a 40-year low or something right, like that. Right, around 62%. It's, it's the lowest it's been in the post-war cycle here. And a lot of people say that generally, not all the time, it telegraphs more sweeping problems. Given the market volatility, given the fact that we had a recovery, say what you will, Scott, that can maybe long in the tooth, maybe uh, we're due this year for comeuppance. What do you think? Uh, you know, I don't think we ever had that recovery because, again, I look at that bottom. I, I mean, it's, it's a fantasy. Some some people made some money on the on the stock market or made some money in v, in the VC world because that's the only place you could venture capital. Again, yeah. When you don't, yeah, when you don't have a, a an interest rate that reflects the true cost of capital longer term, you're getting huge misallocations of dollars. And when we have this quantitative easing or government taxing everybody without going through Congress, which is, which is what the Fed does when it prints money at a greater rate than the GDP. And, and as a policy measure, what we're doing is we're ruining people's nest eggs, we're lowering their buying power, and now everybody's nervous about lower gas prices. I think that's huge. I mean, energy is built into everything. That should be a real positive for everybody. But all of these other things that are happening, raising minimum wage, more regulations, more redistribution, more misallocation of capital, all of this uh, market uncertainty. Are we going to have a socialist in there? Are we going to have a, uh, a crony so-and-so that doesn't believe in the rule of law? Are we going to have traditional uh, Republican candidates who are all for big government, or are we going to have some really strange answers in there? I mean, it, it, there's so much well, uncertainty in the election. Well, who would you put in the in strange answer uh, front? Last time I had you here, you were had your concerns about the kind of stuff Donald Trump was saying on the stump. You didn't commit to any candidate. Have you since committed to a candidate? Well, I have said that the the worst CEO is a thousand times better than the best politician eh. and uh, there are a couple of CEOs I ha the only candidate I've actually given money to so far was Carly Fiorina and I think she's really understands the private sector and and she's not in it for personal gain financial gain I look back and it's always interesting to see which which candidates actually got rich because of they were president as opposed to those who didn't leverage that and, and I just I just want somebody who's in it for the country uh, and and is going to drive personal responsibility fairness rule yeah. of law uh, federalism forbearance all of those great traits that uh, we've had in uh, in some uh, past administration. Well, let me ask you about Donald Trump because he is the front runner for the time being and we had a big debate last week on, on Fox Business and he was pounding themes that uh, uh, surprised a lot of folks. In fact, his defense of New Yorkers uh, that many say represented a seminal moment in his campaign, a thoughtful moment, and that he is capable of being very, very presidential. Do you buy that? I, I think he's a very smart man. There's no question that he's intelligent. There's no question he uh, is, has uh, what I call managerial courage. There's no question he's learned a lot uh, having been in the private sector for as long as he has. Uh, I think some of his policy issues, uh, you know, if he gets elected, I'm sure hopeful that uh, he actually sits down and thinks through protectionism and other things like that. So you think things uh, like trade tariffs, do to even the, though the American he, worker. I'm sorry, Scott, even though he talked about at first a 45% tariff on Chinese goods, then walked that back a little bit, but still open to a tariff. 
He has argued a central premise of his is that the Chinese need us a lot more than we need them, and that our posture has been through Democratic and Republican administrations alike, one that we're on defense all the time. Do you agree with that? I, I, think, I think we have uh, a lot of people who don't understand how trade works, who don't, don't understand how business works, and who aren't great negotiators. So I, I would imagine that, uh, that Donald will actually bring a whole new level of uh, sophistication, a little bit of randomness. Uh, you know, the Boston cab driver tends to get through traffic by, uh, by being a little, uh, a little scary at times. And, you know, I don't, that may be some of his uh, negotiating strategies. I like that. That's the first time I heard Donald Trump may be compared to a Boston cab driver. Uh, that's not too bad. Scott McNeely, always good seeing you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I like that line. Maybe I think I'm going to use that. All right.